Hi, it's Steve Hassan, and I'm honored to be uh, interviewing today an old friend and colleague, Alexandra Stain, who's over in the UK. Uh, Alexandra, uh, we've known each other a long time. Uh, this is your memoir of, of your time in a political cult, which was very uh, well written and very interesting. And I believe at some point you came across my book, which is how our paths crossed maybe or something. We, yes, uh, very soon after I got out. Uh -huh. uh, well, there's a story there. I don't know if you want that story. Yeah, I, I think we'll skip the story, but I mostly <laughs> want to tell people I'm very excited about your new book. Uh, a theoretical book about dissociation, attachment, uh, what's going on with terror, love, and brainwashing. Yeah. And I, I'd like to start the interview out with you just sharing what you want to, to let the public know about, about your experiences and what the phenomenon's about. Well, you know, as a young woman, I got into this supposedly left-wing political cult. And again, I won't go into the story. It's in the first book. But um, after 10 long and dreary years, I managed to get myself out with some other people from the group, which mm -hmm. made it easier. And I really felt driven to understand how I'd become trapped in this thing where I was not, I didn't fit the stereotype that I had in my mind of the kind of person who might get trapped in a cult. So yeah, me I, too, by the way. Yeah, and in fact, <laughs> Of course, as one studies this, we learn that that stereotype is quite right. false. Right. Um, but I, so I first kind of recovered by writing that first book. And then I, you know, to cut a long story short, went on to study at the University of Minnesota, do interdisciplinary studies first, which is a very important way of getting at this topic. And then I um, went to the sociology department and did a PhD, but fundamentally in social psychology mm -hmm. great focused on the issue of cults and totalitarianism and, and you teach right you're an academic i teach um i uh have taught at the university of minnesota at uh, birkbeck in the university of london i now teach at the mary ward center and i do quite a lot of lecturing and writing on the topic i'm now involved somewhat with um some work around radicalization, European uh, work on that. Great. Writing about that. Very important. And, and the way I look at this topic, I'm sort of calling it the second risk right now mm -hmm. uh, in my head. Um, the first risk to uh, our globe's well being, obviously, being climate change. And I agree. I have no qualifications to help anyone really understand that. Uh, but I do have qualifications, I think, as do you, to expound on the second risk that I think our, our world is facing, and that's that of totalitarianism mm -hmm. in all its different forms, right. uh, from very intimate personal one-on-one -on -one relationships, which I call the kind of micro level to the middle or meso level of group, Yes. And the macro level of nations and the kinds of threats and, and nations that we see, such as North Korea, that are suffocating under these totalitarian regimes and yes. the rising threats around the world that I think people are, are very familiar with and frightened about. As yes, I'm, I agree. So that's uh, and then I. So I think it's really, really important work and it's becoming, I think, um, noticed a little more. It's been quite a hidden field in recent years, I think. Um, and so I think people like you and I have been trying to raise the profile of this work and say, hey, we really have to understand this stuff because it's affecting so many of us. It's not just the little weird cults over here and over there also is very much an issue on the political stage. Yeah, I would, I would um, say the radicalization piece, which you mentioned, is absolutely humongous. Yeah. And uh, the tra uh, trafficking is another global threat involving tens of millions of, of people. Um, right. And so I, I, I'm concurring. Uh, and, and for me, the, the, the key angle in is about influence. It's, we're in the age of influence, and now with social media, digital 
with gathering information of, about our personal preferences and such and AI coming in, it's becoming even more uh, 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 important for people who are former members who've studied this phenomenon of what I refer to as mind control, Lifton calls it thought reform, other people call it brainwashing. But l let me listen yeah. to you. So, and, and I tend to use any of those words, but I like the word brainwashing because I think it more of the public have a gut level understanding of it, if not perfect level. Yes. Gets them in the right direction. And actually, you've influenced me, I have to confess, <laughs> because when you, when, you, when you were talking about brainwashing, I'm like, you're right, the public, as the public likes the word deprogramming, which I hate, which is you know, the intervention thing, but that's what the public thinks when, when they're understanding getting out. So we, we want to use words that connect with yeah. people's and the, experiences. And of course the word cult, which as we know is very contested in our field by people who want to say that such things don't exist, yet they talk about them. So that is a contradiction. But again, yes, exactly. lay person has a kind of gut level understanding that a cult is generally not a good thing. Um, you know, so anyway, so yes, a whole we could do yes. a whole thing on vocabulary. Um, but the way I approach this stuff is to try to, which may be a little different than you, but I think complementary with your work, is to categorize. So rather than the influence continuum, which I know you use, mm -hmm. I'm more like go, yes, and there are certain categories within that that we can quite clearly, uh, you know, parcel out. Right. So, so that's, and I focus on the category of the actual kind of organization of a what I call a totalist, meaning that can be a, any size uh, from totalitarian to cult to re relationship. So I use the word totalist from Lifton. Good. I, I kind of have parceled out as my interest. What exactly do those relationships and the and the and when they're more than a relationship and organization look like, and how do they operate? Um, and, you know, I've talked about this a lot in other kind of, uh, venues, but, you know, that you have the charismatic and authoritarian leader who's sort of driving the whole thing, the whole structure of the thing mm -hmm. um, with this kind of uh, <laughs> fake news love aspect to their personality. You know, I'm the great one. I'm going to save you. I'm wonderful. With this harsh bullying a uh, cruel authoritarian side. Mm -hmm. and, and we can then trace those two elements all the way through an organization and to its effects on followers. So in a way, that's kind of what my second book was doing. Uh-huh. Um, Great. So, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Well, so just really briefly, and then they, these um, leaders create these isolating closed structures that principally are isolating, where they cut people off from any other attachment relationships, any trusting relationships, even within the group. And the only, they, the whole drive is to get everyone to attach and see as their primary sort of love or attachment figure as being the leader or right. the cause. You know, it, can, it doesn't have to be exactly the leader. It's a little more abstract than that. You know, in my group, I didn't, even know who the leader was, but I was right. like the group was the primary loyalty. Right. And the ideology, I guess, is also totalistic. Right. And then the ideology sort of supports that structure and the role of the leader. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a process of brainwashing, which is what Ben Zablocki, who's a very good scholar in this field, calls the alternation of assault and leniency. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a battering relationship, you know, darling, I love you, but boom. And then, oh, I'm sorry, did I hit you? But I really love you, boom. You know, that kind of... Yeah, good cop, bad cop. Yeah. Uh, we interrogate people. Yeah, exactly. And that's the same dynamic. And it's a highly disorienting, disorganizing dynamic, which leads to things that we know about, like Stockholm Syndrome, mm -hmm. where you start identifying with the captor. And, but you can only do that if you isolate people because mm. if they had somewhere else, you know, if they could go find someone else to look after, comfort them, they would be out of the, di the dynamic. 
So I think to me, isolation is really fundamental in this. Right. And, and um, you, you, the, the cutting off of family and friends is often ideological where, where uh, people have the illusion of choice that they're choosing not to, okay. to, 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 to read the papers, to talk to their friends because they are satanic or because they are part of the bourgeoisie or whatever. Exactly. And it's holding back their development to be this pure transformed person, right? Who's... Right. The so, you know, we you. see these kind of dynamics across this range of, of phenomena. And um, I use what's called attachment theory, which is an evolutionary based theory to look in a, in a way, go down to the physiology of how that dynamic, that assault leniency thing affects our cortisol levels, and then how that affects our processing in the brain where we when we've got constant high cortisol and no way out we st we can dissociate under those conditions right cortisol is is generated from high stress conditions right right and, and then we get into what's called a kind of a trauma bond so if we're in this kind of situation of chronic relational trauma in this relationship with whoever it is mm -hmm. we can't we dissociate, which to my mind simply means we can't think about our feelings. Mm -hmm. So there's, and we kind of know this is going on in the brain where the higher order thinking gets, stops being connected to our mid range brain that has all the emotional processing. And I think what happens in these kind of systems is when that gets kind of split apart by this trauma response, now the group or the leader can, kind of come into the gap mm -hmm. and say, well, you can't think about your feelings, but we can tell you what you're feeling and why. Mm -hmm. And therefore kindly put on the suicide vest and all will be well, you know, or whatever the messages are and you get further dissociated. So in a very brief <laughs> few minutes, right. that's kind of how I'm looking at this stuff. No, I think we were exactly on the same page. I talk about the dual identity, me before the Moonies, me in the Moonies, and the me in the Moonies would never, you know, could only think bad things about my childhood and my family and my friends and the outside world because they were all evil. And I had the true parents and, you know, that connection. And I was very much doing thought stopping against any positive thoughts the outside world or negative thoughts about moon the doctrine or the group um and uh in fact the dsm-5 the american psychiatric association categorizes brainwashing under a dissociative disorder yeah, i think exactly. i think that's right yeah exactly. and i mean it's interesting just for instance you're talking about the true parents how many of these groups use that kind of language it's like yes forget your own family, you know, Pol Pot in Cambodia and the terrible genocide there, he was brother number one. Yes. You know, he wasn't commander Pot, he was your brother, right? And you see this kind of language, you know, really uh, frequently. You were, before we were recording, you were referring to the fantastic book by Jeff Charlotte, The Family, and yes. his other brilliant book, Sea Street. Yes. Really important, important books for understanding what's happening right now in the US. But, you know, he's talking about this group in Washington, D.C. called The Family, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't called, you know, we're a political pressure group. Um, no, it's. Well, the Moonies were called The Family, too. And uh, so the many God, other of course, were called The Family. Right. Um, you know, so we see this language over and again. And there's a reason. It's because. They want your primary attachment to be to them right? so that you're putting your own survival interests are not on the table, only the, those of the group. Right. And it's also, and importantly, it's isolating you from your actual friends or family. Exactly. So there would be a way out of the dissociative trauma bond that's going right. on. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so tell, talk to me about your thoughts about Donald Trump and what's going on in, in our country well, in the U.S. It's complicated. I, th I mean, on the one hand, it's not complicated. The guy is a charismatic authoritarian. He fits my model very nicely. Mm -hmm. Or as I would say, a charismatic bully. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I say that to people, some people say, oh, well, he's not charismatic to me. And I'm going, well, maybe not, but he's charismatic to a lot of people. Right. Yeah, he, people would meet Moon and say, he's not charismatic at all. And I'd be like, if you believed he was 10 times greater than any person in human history, he'd be charismatic. Right. And, and as, <laughs> you know, our sociologists know charisma is really describing a relationship between a follower and leader. Right. And, you know, let's face it, Trump was a TV star. You know, you don't get there without <laughs> having something, right? Well, and it was a lot of creation of the apprentice to edit out all the things that made him look anything but charismatic right. and successful. Right. So there was a lot of media manipulation right. in the construction of that. Absolutely, persona. absolutely. And, as, and again, I think we see that in a lot of these instances yep. you, see, you don't see yeah you, know, you get the bullying with these leaders the authoritarianism but you it is closely managed what you're seeing and right. how you're seeing that so, so would, anyway, you, would you say as an expert on brainwashing and cults that you see a kind of brainwashing going on or what how would you well, yeah i mean it, again it's it's complicated because yeah. It's not clear, and again, you were mentioning this before, you know, that what all the forces are. Now, one thing that's clear to me that hasn't come out enough in the media is the role of the family and its associated network of extremist, right-wing fundamentalist cults, these Mm -hmm. mega churches. um, And I just think that hasn't come to light enough what their role has been. Totally agree. Hugely important. Because in a way, I think, and I don't totally know, but I, I think yeah, that's his base and that's a cultic base. Right. Uh, his relationship to that, I think, is a bit complicated. I don't fully claim to understand when and how they picked him and how he relates. He's obviously not a fundamentalist evangelical. No. You know, he is right wing. We know that. But so, yeah, how that all happened is unclear to me and of great interest to me. But he has been lifted up as the direct connection sent by God right. um, to lead the troops to, you know, the rapture and all the rest of it. And, you know, this is a cultic, very dangerous ideology and importantly structure of these, this base fits this isolating hierarchical and so forth structure. Right of a cult of cults but they have various leaders so there's some you know how all that's working together i i can't really comment on other uh-huh. than we should be researching it and figuring it out so in your studies alexandra uh would you say that a lot of these charismatic leaders of cults fit a narcissistic or a malignant narcissistic yeah I, I think we could, different people use different terms. I think that's a good term. And Dan Shaw's work on traumatic narcissism is really strong in this area. Um, I, ref, I call them psychopaths because um, yes. I think they fit that as well. And Yanya Lalich's book lays that out very well as well in her mm-hmm. book, Take Back Your Life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can use different words, but we're all talking about the same phenomena. And I call it charismatic authoritarian. Okay. We're talking these same qualities of a ruthless, charming, cruel, clever, etc. cetera. You know, there's a list of traits. Right. Um, need all the attention to themselves, have a high, have a basic need to control others. Right. Lack of empathy. Lack yeah. of empathy. Be a, a lack of social perspective taking that goes along with that. Yeah. Often sexual um, acting uh, out, deviance, acting out, sexual acting out. Which are, mm-hmm. so you know he he fits without any trouble at all. All of those things. Mm-hmm. The lying, of course, you know he's yes. going to go down in history as one of the most prolific liars of all time, and of course the lying comes with the brainwashing in terms of what the ideology of a cult does. And Hannah Arendt is really brilliant on this is it creates a fiction. So you have your real world that you're going about in and that in that dissociation, 
the cult's kind of telling this fictional story about, you know, you're tired and unhappy and miserable of being in the cult, but they're saying, no, this is really wonderful here. Everything's <laughs> great. And it's just, you know, you're maybe not praying hard enough or, you know, not working hard enough. And, you know, Trump's endless lies, which are so obviously lies, I think are very much part of that creating this fictional reality, you know, and, and all, so it gives people an explanation of their distress that's nothing right. to do with what the real cause. Right. But because it's fake, it's also quite confusing. Right. So that confusion also helps keep the dissociation going, meaning you're just not able to look at the reality and make a useful evaluation of it. Right. It's like, well, he says we must kick out all the immigrants or the immigrants are a marauding mass who are going to murder us all in our beds. So I'm not sure my, my you know, Latino neighbor would do that, but it must be right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the, the, the uber confident, charismatic leader who says, trust me, I know um, right. I'm greater than anybody. I have information no one else has. And the, Right. The, the fear factor of the deep state and the fake news and the globalist conspiracy that he's going to be against, even though he's, you know, a very wealthy man who lives affluently and does not care about the average citizen who voted for him. And, you know, it is terrifying. You know, just yesterday we had the International Day of Remembrance of the Holocaust, you know. Yes. <laughs> And, you know, we have all these people saying never again. And yet, and I'm not saying he's, you know, at that point, but we see these signs that are the same kind of signs. Right. Of the demonization, the dehumanization of outsiders. Um, it's very frightening. And we really have to learn and teach our children and others so that we can be aware of where this leads because it's not benign. It's not just funny that he uses this kind of language and that he lies constantly. Yeah. And uh, I want to come back to what you, something you said in the very beginning of this interview, which is uh, when you were in the cult uh, you, you, and, and then waking up, you, you, you said, I never thought of myself as someone who could be in a group like this. I was like anti-authority, you know, Basically, think for yourself. Right. Creativity was the most important thing as well. And I, I guess I want to use this opportunity just to state, you know, the fundamental attribution error of social psychology where people look at people, they don't know why they're doing what they're doing, and they tend to blame the victim or find a locus of explanation, the person's weak, they're stupid, they're uneducated, you know, that's why they get into a cult as opposed to <laughs> they didn't, they were lied to, they were tricked, they were put in an isolated situation, they were sleep deprived, you know, and all the bite model factors that I talk about in more extreme cases. And what I'm, I'm also seeing, and I think you probably do too, is just how much social media and the digital era is affecting people's uh, brains and their well, ability to function by overload of information and... Well, you don't know what's true. You don't have... It's sort of detached from your lived experience. Mm -hmm. so how do you evaluate it? But I think the other thing is the atomization. I mean, this has been going on for many decades but the atomization of our social structures. So, you know, I don't want to idealize the past, but nonetheless, like take in England, you know, there used to be a pub on every corner and, and or people were in trade unions. Mm -hmm. or, you know, people lived in a community that was not constantly shifting. You know, I've lived in this neighborhood of, uh, of mine in London for 10 years now. You don't meet people who are your neighbors. Mm -hmm. I mean, last week I was at a party. I met people who've lived here as long as I or longer, and I had no idea they lived three doors down. Uh -huh. so we're very, we're lo we've lost a lot of our community and other 
structures that give us a way to relate to other people in person. In right. The flesh. Right. You know, um, people don't even necessarily go out to bars or parties, you know, where on the internet, right? If right. Everyone, everyone's, I'm sure is just as bad as me. We're all, you know, hooked on the internet. And I, you know, the internet is a means of communication and it obviously has marvelous elements to it, but we're lacking that in those in-person community ties. And I think that makes us as a society very vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and again, Hannah Arendt talks about this, that we don't have these structures that we're kind of become this mass that then people need and want, to belong right often right. people say to me oh people who join cults just want need to belong and i laugh at them i say well we're human beings we all need to belong right that's the problem we don't have things to belong to hmm. um i i, I, I the problems you yeah, know so no, people definitely. want to go to a church or a yoga class or something if they get the wrong one they're now screwed so as we wrap this up, I'm wondering if you can opine on ways to help people who maybe are Trump believers. And I, I want to point uh, at a New York Times picture. Any, any, any uh, ideas about how to help wake people up to what is actually happening? This is not playing to my strengths, I'm afraid. That's um, okay. <laughs> I figured I'd ask. I'm yeah. Due I due mean, diligence. I think try to main, you know, what we say when we lose someone to a cult, I think is relevant. Of course. You know, the cult wants you to be angry at the person who, you know, so when someone joins a cult, they cut off their family pretty much 100% of the time. And the family gets very upset because they're being rejected. Right. And we as counselors try to say to the families, don't, try not to be angry with your loved one and try to stay in touch with them in a friendly and kind, right. and I think you say gently questioning manner. And I would say let's use those principles. Yeah, here. exactly. Don't let them divide us into hate groups. You know, that's the danger. Um, yeah, because yeah. people will get, you know, equally uh, totalists on the other side. Yeah, and also it drives the people in the totalist group further in. Right. So how you do that, I don't know. You know, um, have barbecues and, <laughs> you know, try to be friendly, you know. <laughs> no, exactly. You, you find common ground. You remind the person of positive experiences in the past that you shared with them. You tell them that you love them no matter what. You know, tell them that, you no. Know, you know, when they're ready to, you know, have conversations that are content about the ideology or the structure that you want to listen. And you keep also giving them information about what's really going on. You know, try to get through the fictional account. Yeah, you know, I find that's of... problematic if the, if the cult member says, uh, you know, I don't want to hear anything negative about my group. Yeah. Uh, and so my strategy is to share information about other groups. <laughs> That's right. That's other right. things in social psychology. That's right. Right. Um, just a, just two very small things. I don't know if they belong here. You can edit them out if you wish. But the other thing that Trump has been doing that looks very cultic to me is the whole way that he manages his lieutenant layer. Mm-hmm. And the, more. So, you know, in cults and uh, again, Aaron on Hitler and Stalin, you know, you can't, you have to have a lieutenant layer in a big, a big operation. Right. Middle, but you've got to keep them unstable. You don't want them to then start competing with you. Mm -hmm. So you tend to see very volatile lieutenant layer where people are getting promoted and demoted rather quickly. And I mean, what we're seeing in the Trump administration is perfect. Also, the fact that he didn't, they also don't like stable bureaucracies. So a normal, even a right-wing administration, you know, even Reagan or Bush's administration that I personally may not have liked, but they weren't totalitarian. They worked through a stable bureaucracy of civil servants and right. 
so forth. Trump didn't fill how many thousands of his positions that right. he had to fill. He doesn't want that. He wants direct control. Mm -hmm. And that also speaks to the tweeting. It's like, I'm not going to issue messages that maybe go through a few levels. I'm just going to speak directly. You know, so all these, you know, the not having a bureaucracy, the direct communication and the unstable lieutenant layer, they're actually things I talk about in my book, Terror, Love and Brainwashing. So they're quite, they jumped out at me when I started seeing them. Yeah, that's very, very important. Yeah. You know that Trump uh, initiated a, an emergency communication system for the first time where cell that. phones were beeping even though they were off mm -hmm. and he was talking directly to everybody? That scared me a lot. Terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. So... There you, there you have yeah. it. So I want to thank you profoundly. I want to remind people of your book, Terror, Love, and Brainwashing. When you use the word love in a technology. I really mean love in quotes. Okay. Conditional right. love. Love, <laughs> love the leader, not love yourself. Correct. Or your family. And brainwashing attachment and cults and totalitarian systems. Yeah. I want to thank you for your good work and thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. You're most welcome. Okay. Thank you.